All right, we're at the top of the hour, so let's get started. Greetings, and thank you all for attending this month's science seminar presented by the NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON, which is operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and NEON. We are very excited to have Tom Q here to present with us today, but before we turn it over to the speaker, I'd like to go through a few logistics. We have enabled optional automated closed captioning for today's talk. So if you would like to use that feature, please find the CC button in your Zoom menu bar. The webinar will consist of a presentation followed by Q&A. As you think of questions, please add them to the Q&A box. We also have a meeting chat, so you can use this to share links or other items of interest with the group, but do place your questions for the speaker in the Q&A. We'll facilitate discussion at the end, and there should also be opportunity to ask questions over audio by raising your hand. NEON welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation, as outlined in our NEON Code of Conduct. And this applies to NEON staff as well as anyone participating in a NEON event. The full code of conduct is available via a link that I will drop into the chat in a moment and also um, embedded in the Science Seminars webpage, which I am showing here. I believe the code of conduct is um, down here. Uh, this talk will be recorded and made available for later reviewing on this same Science Seminars webpage. If you click on the talk for today, we will embed the video in the event page for this talk once it's available. And to complement our monthly science seminars, we host related data skills webinars on how to access and use NEON data. Registration for those is also available on the same webpage, which I will make sure to drop a link to the page in the chat shortly. You can see that our first webinar is coming up later in September, and we would love to have any of you join for that. Lastly, if you have ideas for a great talk, uh, future talk for the seminar series, consider nominating yourself or a colleague today by filling out the form uh, up here toward the top of the seminar's webpage. All right, now I'm happy to turn it over to Laura Nagel to in introduce today's speaker. Hi everyone. Um, Tong Chu is an assistant professor at the Pennsylvania State University, where he leads the Spatial Ecology and Environmental Data, Data Sciences, or SEEDS lab. His lab is dedicated to understanding how forest ecosystems are functioning under global change at scales ranging from individual trees to the entire globe. To achieve this, they use satellite and airborne remote sensing, monitoring studies, and advanced statistical models to quantify the regeneration potential of global forests in a rapidly changing climate. His lab also seeks to determine how climate and habitat characteristics influence biodiversity change by integrating data from NEON Airborne Observatory Platform and Biological Survey. Welcome, Tong Chu. Thank you very much, Laura. Let me share my screen. Um, screen one and the uh, slides. Okay, here we go. Okay, thanks again for the warm instruction. Uh, this Neon Science Seminar has a really great series talk. I'm really happy to be part of it and share some of the results from synthesizing Neon AOP with biological survey data on the ground. Uh, so basically today's talk focus on two topics. So as we know, NEON really offers uh, amazing resources for ecological research by providing a consistent and long-term data across a diverse ecosystem system at a continental scale. So through its standardized data collection and state-of-the-art instrumentation, so NEON really enables ecologists to understand and predict future environmental change. So today's talk gives two examples that a synthesized biological survey on the ground with NEON AOP, which is airborne observation platform, so NEON remote sensing approach to better monitoring bio biodiversity change. So the first, first example focuses on the role of AOP derived habitat characteristics. And the second example aims to quantify the fundamental role of food supply in quantified biodiversity change. So now let's start with the first example that estimate the response of ground beetles to the, to the interactions between climate and habitat variables. So terrestrial insects provide important ecosystem services and functions that are critical to human well-being. 
such as pollination of fruits and vegetables, acting as biological control agent for weeds and agricultural pests, and contribution to nutrient cycling through the decomposition process. So while insects have many important ecological and economic values, there's a growing evidence suggesting that insect population are facing severe threats under climate change. So in 2021, a special issue, special issue that includes 11 papers on PNS provides assessments of insect population decline and summarize the environmental stressors that drive those trends. So climate change, including increasing temperature, more severe drought events, and more frequent extreme weather events, all contributed to this insect decline trends. Additionally, like habitat loss, uh, fragmentation, and degradation have eliminated the essential environments that insects rely on. So examples include uh, deforestation and the wide usage of pesticide from agricultural intensification, as well as pollutions from urbanization. So air pollution, light pollution, and chemical pollutions that are associated with urbanization process. So those stressors are directly linked to the decline of insect population. And the evaluation of this insect decline across biogeographic bio scale relies on meta-analysis in the current literature. So the first uh, meta-analysis is a cover article on science, which found that terrestrial insects are declining at a rate of approximately 1% per year, as indicated by the prevalent negative slopes in this figure. So their results are primarily driven by European and North America datasets. However, in about six months, a paper on nature ecology and evolution found the contradicting results, where the overall trends of insect population are actually around zeros in 15 long-term ecological research sites across the United States. The large inconsistencies between the two meta-analyses can arise for several reasons. First, time series of insect population are usually noisy. It is difficult to generate reliable estimates of trends from these types of data. Even when we have long time series, meta-analysis offers aggregated information that is challenging to capture the species specific process at individual scale. The aggregated data is also uh, from studies that implement a different sampling strategy, which could introduce biases into the trends estimation. Additionally, the coverage of sites in those meta-analyses are not balanced over climate and habitat space. To resolve those challenges, we use ground beetles at the study system, which are monitored using the same protocol and consistently monitored across neon sites. So ground beetles is one of the most diverse species group with 40,000 species globally and 2,000 species in North America. So interpretation of species, uh, so, so if you want to interpret the trends at species level, it will be challenging because we have so many species, but traits can generalize species level response to global change. Examples of traits are demonstrated in this figure. So for example, some species have really long legs and powerful metabols like the tiger beetles, making them formidable predators in the insect world. So they are fast runners and can easily chase down their prey. Some species are also burrowers and can feed on the insects in the soil. Some species can fly or climb on trees, pursuing prey in the canopies. Many species have a broad diet, eating not only other insects, but also on seeds and plants. So all those traits, such as body size, running, flight, burrowing, and diets, make ground beetles an important biological control agent in the agricultural system because it can reduce weeds and insect pests in the crop fields. This study focused on answering two questions. First, how do ground beetles traits influence their ability to thrive under global change? And how does habitat modulate the effect of climate change on ground beetles? As I mentioned earlier, NEON provides unprecedented opportunity to answer those research questions. So ground observations from NEON includes over 700 species and 2,500 plus years that cover multiple habitat types, so including boreal tundra to temperate conifers and deciduous forest, and then to tropical forest. 
Most importantly, they use standardized methods and protocols for data collection across all sites. This ensures consistency and comparability of data, which is critical when we aim to understand which combination of trees and habitat influence the climate impacts on ground beetles. We also supplement NEON data with uh, data from literature that implement a similar sampling protocol. So those new sites are colored by orange in this figure. A little background on the NEON sampling protocol. So ground beetles are collected using pitfall traps approach. The figures on the left shows the arrangement of traps within each plot. Three or four traps are installed within each distributed base plot of a given NEON site. Uh, pitfall traps are emptied bi-weekly during the active screening season for ground beetles. So species are identified by technician, and then a subset of those species is also validated by expert taxonomist. Example of two species at different habitat, so deciduous versus uh, pasture, and their bi-weekly time series from June to September is demonstrated in this figure. So even though NEON provides such amazing data, there are still some modeling challenges. Like many ecological data, there are massive zeros in the abundance which are difficult to handle in traditional models. If we plot the histogram of abundance uh, for ground beetles, we can see there's a median of zero. And ground beetles are not only affected by climate variables. So they are not only responding to temperature or deficit. They are also responding to habitat change. So because their body size is generally very small, fine spatial scale habitat information are very important predict predictors, but they are rarely explored in the literature. Uh, so furthermore, species live within communities where the abundance of one species depends not only on, on its environmental conditions, such as climate and habitat, but also on the abundance of, of other species. So in other words, species do not respond independently to climate and habitat, and it is important to model multiple species jointly. Finally, there's a, a climate habitat interaction, which will be demonstrated in the next slides. So the term climate habitat interactions describe the effects of climate that depend on the heterogeneous habitat. We can use the interaction between temperature and canopy gaps as an example. Canopy gaps is introduced by deforestation, disturbance, and forest dieback. Where there are openings in forest canopy, there are there is like an immediate increase in sunlight penetration to the forest floor. This higher solar radiation can increase the temperature within the gap compared to the shaded understory. For example, in this figure, temperature is cooler if forest density is higher. Therefore, there is a possibility that larger gaps can amplify the effects of climate warming we would expect a positive interaction between temperature and gaps if increasing temperature has a larger effect when canopy is more open. By contrast, larger gaps also means fallen logs, branches, and storms that could offer shelters for ground beetles, protecting them from predators and environmental stressors. If fallen trees provide local refugees that buffer the impacts of climate warming, then we would expect a negative interaction between forest gaps and the climate warming, where warming impacts are less severe in more open canopy than closed ones. Those would be the two hypotheses we have regarding to how habitat modulate climate impacts on ground beetles. Now, NEON Airborne Observation Platform, AOP, offers cutting edge remote sensing approach that allows us to test those hypotheses. The first approach is light detection and ranging, LIDAR, which uses laser and active remote sensing approach to record information start from the top of the canopy, through the canopy, and all the way to the ground. For example, LIDAR will characterize forest structure along a transect to include the top of the tree crowns as warm colors and understory and ground as the cold colors. This unique of data size will enable the quantification of understory vegetation density, defined as the density of those blue points near the surface. A dense understory may, may, may influence ground beetles' foraging efficiencies, but also reduce its exposure to predators. 
So we include that as an important predictor in the model. Predictor in the model. The second metrics is gap fraction in a forest stand, where purple color are the gaps and yellow are the tree crowns. As I mentioned in the in the previous slides, it is a primary contributor to the climate habitat induction that we will test in this study. Finally, there's the terrain roughness, which can be derived using the ground elevation that LIDAR measures. It potentially influences the mobility of ground beetles when they are moving on the ground. Neon AOP also provides the hyperspectral remote sensing approach, which captures data at a very narrow and continuous along the spectral dimension of this data cube, allowing a detailed analysis of reflected light from vegetation. So through the collaboration with, with Phil Thompson and Kyle Kovac at University of Wisconsin Medicine, we have estimated concentrations of nitrogen in the canopy. The figures on the right include two neon sites, the Joseph Jones Ecological Research Center in Georgia, which is characterized by longleaf pine uh, mixed with patches of deciduous forest. The bottom panel is Anderk, University of Notre Dame Environmental Research Center, that is characterized by primarily uh, this is just hardwood. So hyperspectral remote sensing were able to capture variations in nutrients concentration across crowns, where canopy nitrogen is lower in conifers compared to that in the deciduous. So therefore, we would expect a higher nitrogen in the uh, Joseph Jones Ecological Research Center than the ones in, uh, sorry, in, in the under compared to the ones in Joseph Jones Ecological Research Center. So now this, uh, uh, as a proxy of ecosystem productivity, the derived canopy nitrogen is an important habitat variable. So higher canopy, canopy nitrogen could support a higher population of ground beetles that feed directly or indirectly on those plants. So which means a higher canopy nitrogen could support a higher population of, of caterpillars that feed on those plants. And then also will support a higher uh, population of ground beetles which, which feed on those caterpillars if that's an indirect relationship. So those are the bottom-up bottom, bottom up controls. On the other hand, higher vegetation productivity could also support birds and small mammals that are predators of ground beetles, reducing their population. So these are top-down controls. So we explore those dynamics by, introduce, by in introducing canopy nutrients as a predictor in the model. So recall that there are multiple challenges in modeling ground beetles abundance. The first two challenges has, have been resolved using NEON and its airborne remote sensing data. So from the uh, NEON offers a constant sampling at a continental scale. And also we have a one meter spatial resolution uh, habitat variables derived from NEON AOP. The other three will be addressed by the generalized joint attribute model, GGM. So GGM is developed by Dr. Jim Clark at Duke University. It is a Bayesian high model that handles median zero data with partitioning. The partition translates the observed discrete abundance into a continuous latent variable. So which means the median zero data will be able to handle in this Bayesian high model. Then the latent variable is quantified by the design matrix, coefficient, and the covariance matrix, which enables the joint modeling of species. The covariates are the predictors in this model. They include climate variables such as temperature and moisture deficit. There are also three light up derived habitat variables, including canopy gaps, uh, undershore density, and terrain roughness, and also one hyperspectral derived canopy nitrogen. So finally, there's the interaction between gaps and uh, temperature. So, and then we also model trees jointly uh, with the species through a predictive trees modeling approach. So we are, transform we are transforming uh, trees by communities using a uh, species by trace matrix. The results uh, taking over all species across neon sites, the LIDAR derived habitat variables, canopy gap, is the most important source of variation in species abundance, as indicated by the blue bar, as well as for trees, which is the purple bar. So by contrast, terrain roughness account for lower overall variations in the community. So this sensitivity are uh, ranked across different predictors. So higher uh, importance of uh, predictors will be ranked higher in this uh, plot. Now, as for the climate variables, uh, they are follow 
the canopy gaps, including temperature and moisture deficit. So similar to canopy gaps, they are more important for predicting trees than species abundance. A traditional literature of ecological study will find that climate variables is more important than habitat. So however, through a continental study, we found habitat variables is more important than clim climate variables in terms of, of explaining variations in trees and abundance. Regarding to the uh, canopy nitrogen from hypersurfer data, so they are more important in explaining variations in species abundance than in predicting traits. And the interaction between gap and temperature is just followed, uh, followed uh, is, is following the hyperspectral uh, canopy nitrogen. This figure shows the coefficient matrix where each row indicates a trait and each column is a predictor. So brown and teal color represent negative and positive coefficients respectively. The bounding boxes in this figure uh, highlighted similarities within different groups. For example, the lower left bot, uh, box include a group of trees that are negatively related with canopy gaps and the moisture deficit, while trees in the lower while, while trees in the lower right uh, boxes expect a positive relation with temperature and anthropogenic density. So those have teal colors in this group and brown colors in this group. So the usage of this coefficient matrix really can help us identify different trait syndromes on the right in this correlation matrix. Positive correlation, which are colored red in this new matrix, means that the group of traits share a similar response to predictors in the model. So trait syndromes include large-bodied borrowing omnivores, grassland flyers, forest carnivores, and other groups. So those traits can evaluate how different species can survive and the global change. So for example, these slides have one small body size frequent flyer that live in the grassland, Agnolatus uh, conjectus. The other one, Thrusticus pennsylvanicus, has larger body size, cannot fly, and primarily found in the forest. To compare their response to global change, we predict their abundance change between historical and future time interval under projected climate change scenarios. Now these slides provide the information that the small non-flyer species will increase throughout North America under future warming scenarios, as shown by the red color. Because the species are responding positively to increase in temperature. So it really enjoys an increase in temperature, which can increase its abundance over time. By contrast, Persicus pennsylvanica are responding negatively to warming, which means that its abundance will decline throughout the map. However, the projected changes are actually spatially heterogeneous with no uniform trends. We see some blue points, but there are also some red points, which means they are increasing over time. The interesting pattern is caused by climate habitat inductions. On the left side of this equation, we have abundance change caused by temperature, which is delta W with subscript T which equals to the summation of direct effects and interaction effects on the right side of the equation. The sum of those two gives the full effects of temperature, which is what we saw in the previous figure. Direct effects of temperature equals to the coefficient of temperature times temperature change, which is delta T. The effects of interaction, the second term in the, on, the left, on the right side of the equation, equals to the coefficient times the multiplication of delta T and the canopy gaps. So for this species, Perversicus pennsylvanicus, the coefficient to temperature is always negative, but the interaction coefficient is positive. Now, if we put those equations in the map, first, we have a temperature change delta T with a gradient of red colors indicating different degree of warming between historical background and future time intervals. So the abundance of change caused by warming which is delta W with subscript T, equals to the negative coefficient times the delta T. The whole product is then negative, and the abundance of ground beetles are projected to decline in the future across the continent. But the impacts of climate change will differ by canopy gaps. Yellow color in this figure are forest with, uh, uh, not just forests, but other types of ecosystem with higher fraction of gaps and can be found in the central Great Plains 
and blue are closed stand, mainly in the Northeast. Now, if we go back to the original negative products, which is the direct effects of temperature, the second term in the equation, the effects of temperature that are modulated by gaps is a positive product. Therefore, it is, it is capable to offset the declining effects from the direct effects of temperature change and even reverse the sign when gaps is large, like the central grid plans of this map. So which can really result into a spatially heterogeneous response to climate change. So this heterogeneous response that results from climate uh, result from the canopy gaps can also be visualized at landscapes uh, in Northwest forest where they are both open and closed then. If we take a look at this uh, landscape level variation, so they are both open and closed stand. So background maps shows the local terrain information. Symbology of the points follow the previous maps. So red means de increasing and blue means decreasing. So all of the red points in this figure, which means projected increase of, of abundance change in the future compared to the historical background. There are places with open stand where yellow are tree crowns and purple patches are gaps. So a larger canopy gaps is more likely to be related with the increase of a projected increase of abundance change. Similarly, the projected decline of abundance mainly occur at plots with a lower fraction of gaps. So this really summarizes this, this habitat can really modulate climate change on the abundance change of ground beetles. We have also developed an open source online virtualization platform for the scientific community and the policy makers. The website is called pbgjam.org. So this website is trying to apply advanced statistical models and remote sensing approach to understand and forecast the effects of a changing climate on the abundance and, and distribution of American wildlife. So users can select one of the 100 species and identify their projected abundance change across North America under different climate change scenarios. So we have a couple of scenarios, including more severe warming and a more right, uh, and a one more if we control the CO2 concentration uh, that are released from to the atmosphere. Landscape uh, level habitat conditions such as terrain and canopy gaps are viewable with user interactions through the clicking uh, on each of the plots on the left of, of, of this figure. So this really can help the conservation biologists to understand how different habitat might influence uh, different species response to global change. We also generate a wall to wall habitat suitability for each species across the continent. So this is still under development, but we are trying to leverage the near AOP habitat characteristics to better forecast a continental scale prediction of different species abundance. So right now we have uh, trees, small mammals, bird, and also ground beetles. And those are the different scenarios uh, of climate change and also the different uh, intervals in the future and historical mean. Now, if we go back to the two research questions we have, we are able to answer them through the synthesis of a NEON AOP and a biodiversity survey data. First, we found tree syndromes emerge from climate habitat interactions. So remember, there are four different syndromes. So there are large bodied borrowing omnivores, there are forest carnivores and grassland fires, which, able, which was, we were able to quantify through the climate habitat interactions. So ground beetles response are species and tree specific. A small frequent fire is projected to increase under future ch warming change scenarios, while a larger uh, non-fire species shows spatial heterogeneous patterns because gaps provide a buffer against climate warming. So here, the interaction between climate change and uh, uh, and gap fraction is different from how the buffer, uh, how the canopy gaps can amplify the warming impacts. The buffer actually. Uh, sorry, the gaps actually provide the refugees needed to buffer climate warming. So now we understand the importance, the important roles of a habitat, such as energy density, gap fraction in modeling biodiversity. We should look further than just considering habitat uh, factors. So the availability, quality, and the diversity of food supply can have profound effects on the distribution and the abundance of species. The second part of this talk focuses on integrating fecundity monitoring across the NEON plots and linking it with crown nutrients from NEON LP data. So the amount of seeds, fruits, and nuts 
uh, the foundation of forest food web, particularly for the mass consumers like birds and mammals. Even though ground beetles cannot uh, direct, uh, direct, uh, does not directly participate in, into this mask system. They are still influenced by the birds and the mammals because they are their pre predators and they are like a top-down control on their population. So the masking inference forecasting, the mask, uh, Mastiff net network is led by Dr. Jim Clark and involves collaborations with over 100 scientists from five continents. So we have assimilated data over 12 million tree year observations from 1,200 species, 2,000 long-term plots, and more than 3,000 item uh, initialist observations, which are citizen science component. This huge amount of data serves as a foundation to quantify global sea supply and how they can influence forest food webs. So mostly network also include NEON sites. So for quality monitoring is not part of the NEON sampling protocol. So MASTIF supplements NEON's data and bring in more observations for tree dominant sites. So we are not trying to sample all the NEON sites, but we are focused on uh, sites that are, have more trees. Um, there are two different uh, data types. The first data is crop count, which involves observ uh, observing the number of crops each tree produced in each year with a binocular. The second one is seed trap that has a modeling component to link seeds from trees to traps and also seed counts in a trap within a mapped forest stand. So the synthesis of massive data at NEON plots with NEON AOP enables the faculty mapping at individual tree crown scale. This figure includes a large deciduous dominant tree plot at Bartlett Experimental Forest in the Northeast. So it's in the upper panel. And they will also have a conifer dominant small plot at a narrow ridge in the lower panel. So background is a canopy height model from LIDAR, where green means high and brown means low values of tree heights. Each polygon is an individual tree crumbs and they are colored by species. So fecundity is mapped on the red panel, where higher transparencies in this figure indicate low fecundity values. So we are interested in the environmental factors that control this large variation of fecundity from tree to tree and from species to species at the landscape scale. So, the, so we are trying to uh, understand this question, what controls for quantitative variation? And then one of the potential factors in driving for quantitative variation are nutrient levels. So our previous synthesis found that species level for quantity could be related with the species capacity to explore nutrients, such as foliage, uh, foliar nitrogen in the x-axis and foliar phosphorus in the y-axis. So each point in this figure is one species and it's, it is colored by the, its leaf habit. So interestingly, species level for quantity decreases for order of magnitude from the lowest, which has a green color in the background, to the highest, which are the purple color in this, in this figure, along the phosphorus gradient. By contrast, uh, foliage, uh, foliar nitrogen has limited effects. The contour line is almost parallel to the x-axis, indicating that for quantity does not change very much along the nitrogen gradient. However, regarding to the relationship between individual fecundity and the nutrients, studies are still limited to a few locations and a few species due to the large investment needed for field measurement on both nutrients and fecundity variables. You literally have to go to the field to quantify the amount of seeds that a tree produces in each year and also measure the nutrients access to those trees. So it's really a large investment. In horticultural practice, a proper amount of fertilization could stimulate crop yield. On the other hand, trees growing under more fertile sites could potentially grow faster and do not reproduce too much. In other words, increased nutrients might lead to an extensive vegetative growth at the expense of tree fecundity. So there are really two pathways here. So one can stim stimulate crop yield and the, the other one can increase the amount of vegetation growth instead of the tree fecundity. To test those hypotheses, recall that hyperspectral data from NEON AOP can generate canopy, canopy nitrogen. So through the collaboration with Phil Thompson and Cal from Udart Medicine. So we can also produce other nutrients like phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and calcium that are potentially important for fecundity. So we modeled fecundity using those five nutrient variables 
following the same generalized joint attribute model framework, GDAM, in the ground beetle study. So this figure, similar to the ones in ground beetle study, shows the coefficient matrix, where each row is a tree species, and each column is a nutrient predictor. Um, brown and teal color still represents negative and positive correlations, re respectively. So first, we found a prevalent association between high, foli uh, high foliar phosphorus concentration and low individual fecundity in many species, which is consistent with our previous species level synthesis. So where phosphorus can lead to a decline of uh, fecundity about four orders of magnitude. So other bounding boxes in this figure highlight the similarities within different groups. For example, the lower left box include a group of species that are positively related with calcium and magnesium. And the upper right boxes include a group of species that are positively related with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So those uh, different communities with a coherent response to nutrients really emerged on the right in the correlation matrix. Uh, positive correlation, which are colored red in the new matrix, means that the group of species share similar response to nutrients. So there are four, five distinct communities. First one here, and then second one here, and then a bunch of other threes in, in the upper of this uh, matrix. If we put those uh, communities onto the, on the map, the northeastern mountain forest are associated with a higher amount of phosphorus and low calcium. By contrast, the eastern temperate species are negatively correlated with all nutrients. The forests in the west contain species associated with higher nitrogen phosphorus and potassium, but lower calcium and magnesium. These relationships have broader implications when we apply the fitted model from the MASTIV and the NEON plus to forest inventory data and produce a continental scale prediction of fecundity. Now, usually, well, so right now we are using a graded soil fertility uh, product, which is color exchange capacity, which is spatially caused product to predict continental fecundity on the right. So there's a, a fecundity hotspot in the southeastern part of the United States. However, this kind of scale prediction does not benefit from the neon AOP and its connection to canopy nutrients. As demonstrated in the top bottom panels, the AOP derived nutrients variable will help us understand and predict fecundity change at a much finer spatial scale. So we'll be able to track individual tree crowns fecundity and, and their influence on forest food webs from individual trees to the entire continent. So in summation, so we, we are able to answer the question through the synthesis of NEON AOP and the fecundity data. So we found a prevalent negative associ association between fecundity and the crown phosphorus, while other nutrients have a mixed effects. The biogeographic patterns also emerged from this fecundity and nutrients relationship and can inform continental scale prediction of fecundity. Now I want to wrap up this talk by acknowledging uh, the collaborators at Duke University, including the PI Jean Clark, co-PI Jennifer Swinson, and the PhD students Len, Maggie, and Renata, and the technician Jordan. So they are really critical, play a critical role in collecting data and putting together this massive uh, network. I also want to uh, acknowledge the collaborators from, uh, uh, from INRE in France, including Valentine, George, and Benoit, and then Phil and Kyle provided the uh, for, provided the neon AOP derived canopy nutrients, which are critical in understanding fecundity and the ground beetles abundance. And then Aaron Bell is a co author on the ground beetles paper, and he provided other data that supplements neon observations. So, funding from the, for this project, including a uh, National Science Foundation uh, grant, the DEB um, uh, 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 Microsystem Biology grant, and also a uh, uh, two NASA grants from the uh, uh, AIST. I also want to acknowledge Neon for making all the data openly available so that researchers will be able to answer questions at a continental scale. And then uh, this is uh, my contact information and I'm happy to take any questions that, that I may have. Should I stop share? Sure. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. There was so much amazing information in there. Um, just a reminder to everyone, we do have a Q&A box. So as you think of questions for the speaker, neither the first or the second part of the talk, um, pop them in there. I see that we have a few. Laura, are you interested to read those out? Yes, yeah, we can go in order. 
Um, first question is from Alyssa Wilson. Um, and she wants to know, uh, when you were beginning these projects, um, did you start with asking, what question can I ask using NEON data? Or did you ask, what data can I use to address this research question? Um, or is it something in between those two paradigms? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So I, I also have been wondering that question when I was a PhD student. Um, so when I was a, um, a, PhD, a PhD student, I always ask my advisor, so should I just look at those data available and they are open access data, and then should I just use those data to explore some questions? Um, my advisor told me it's kind of a dangerous if you don't have a question in mind, and if you don't have a hypothesis that related with those questions. So I would suggest that you came up with a good question that can uh, make the best usage of NEAM data and then quantify this, uh, answer those amazing ecological questions at a continental scale, and then using this uh, NEAM sampling approach. So that's that would be my, my answer. So I would have a question in mind first before using the NEAM data. Um, the next one is from uh, Shashi Kunduri. Um, I'm curious to know how you calculated the understory density using NEON LIDAR data. LIDAR systems have a range resolution, which makes it challenging to discriminate between two objects if they are too close to one another in a vertical profile. Um, in this case, differentiating low vegetation LIDAR returns from the ground may be challenging due to these range resolution limitations. Even the newest LiDAR system used by NEON has a range resolution of 67 centimeters. Um, so how do you calculate the understory density using the NEON LiDAR data? That's also a very good question. And uh, um, so let me go back to my slides. Uh, I think it would be useful if I can have the slides open. Um, now I need to go back to the slides. Uh, Um, I should try a different approach. Uh, where is it? Oh, it's here. Okay. So we 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 tried actually a bunch of approaches. So the the understory density they influence the mobility of a ground beetle species. So we tried we try to use a several threshold. So we try the understory density between zero point one five meter to two meter. So uh like a lower end of those those blue points and divided by the um. The, from 0 0.15 meter to the entire canopy heights. So that's one approach we tried. We also tried from 0, point, from 0 to 0 0.15 and then divided by 0 to 2. So those are so one is called normalized anosteroid density. The other one is called relative norm, uh, anosteroid density. So we tried both and we use the one that has the highest prediction accuracy. And then, so I understand also Neon has a bunch of uh, um, accuracy, spatial resolution issues. So th th those won't affect the, if you normalize the data across the range of heights. So if you normalize th those across the range of heights, you'll be able to get a standardized anosteroid density across all NEON sites. So that's the approach we use to quantify the anosteroid density. So I hope that answered your question. If you send me an email, I can send you the code I use to derive anosteroid density, and which I, I think can be easily adapted to other LiDAR system, such as USGS LiDAR. Great. Uh, the next question is also from Alyssa Wilson. Um, how do you think spatial processes play into the environmental drivers of beetle communities? For example, gaps that are closer together may change the microclimate at the forest floor more than isolated canopy gaps. Is there any plan to incorporate space into uh, the GJAM um, site? That's also a, a really good question. So basically, we um, let me go back to this figure. So as we, we found the canopy gaps really provide a buffer for ground beetles. So normally if they are microclimatologists, you will think larger gaps may be in, amplified the impacts of warming because there are just so many solar sort of radiation that can penetrate through the forest gap. So the way we handle that is we try to incorporate the spatial variations of canopy, canopy gaps at a continental scale and put all those variations into one single model. So we are trying to model every single neon sites uh, jointly in a, in, a, in a model. So we are not trying to compare different gap levels uh, across time. So we are trying to, inc um, so the, the space information is kind of already incorporated into the GJAM because we model all species and uh, jointly and including a bunch of sites. 
uh, uh, across the, the neon domain. Um, so so the, if we put the interaction between gaps and warming, that, uh, that's, that's can, that can tell us questions on how gaps can modify or mitigate or amplify climate warming effects. Uh, we can also do a similar approach. So if we um, use a climate modeling approach and just uh, change the, uh, the, the level of gaps and then detect how, how this um, level of gaps can influence local climate, we won't be able to directly incorporate gaps in the prediction. So we can, we can just uh, change, we can just remove the gap variable in the model, but change the temperature variables. Uh, that, that's a, another way to isolate the effects of uh, gaps from microclimate. So I uh, hope that answers the question. Wonderful. Next is um, from, sorry, I scrolled here, uh, Michael Kaspari. Um, Pitfall traps do not measure abundance, um, but activity density. Um, so more like individuals moving through a finite area over time. Um, roughly active density is a function of abundance um, times velocity. Um, the question is, could your results be showing uh, not changes in abundance, um, but that gaps um, and warmer uh, neons tower temperatures are associated with more carabid movement, not necessarily uh, carabid abundance? Yeah, I'm reading the questions. Uh, there are also some hypotheses that are related on this question. Okay, that's a really nice hypothesis. Um, yeah, so so one thing we can do is, uh, um, I'm thinking, so the carabat movement. Yes, we do try to quantify the temporal trends of carabat uh, movement. So there's a, another version of GGM called dynamic GGM, which incorporate uh, the movement of a species, the species in interaction, and also climate variables like this a static version of GGM. So we're trying to use that uh, a, a dynamic version of GGM to predict uh, the response of ground beetles to climate and habitat variables. So, and we, we get really noisy response. So it's hard to tell if the ground beetles can move to, from a, a like from a, a open canopy to closed stand because the gaps is closer there and maybe kind of influence the microclimate. So we, we didn't find any meaningful results. It's because for two reasons. The first one is, the neon time series is still very short for the ground beetles, and it's also very noisy because it's bi-weekly sampling. And we hope if we if neon has uh, accumulated more data in the future, we'll be able to re uh, to re-implement that model to understand the movement of ground beetles. Um, regarding to the uh, okay, I think that answers the question. I hope yeah. We we, we the the micro we, we are not using the temperature data at neon plots. We are using the graded temperature from DMAT products. So maybe we can use a the neon tower temperature can better predict the model. So I can try that for sure. Yeah, thank you for your suggestions. The next one is from Courtney Meyer. Um, ooh, okay. I noticed that gaps appear to have strong influence on ground beetle abundance, but Corestone wood um, did not have much effect. Um, I would have thought that Corestone wood abundance and gaps would be strongly correlated. What do you think might be going on here? Um, and did you uh, use neon core stone wood data? Yes, I did. So the cost woody debris is a very important source that, that yeah, neon offers us so, so much data size now that yeah, it's hard to not use all of them. Anyway, so um, the cost woody debris, we use the, the, the volume of, of tree logs in those sites. And then, so the, I, I'm not sure why there's no, diff, why we didn't detect signal of cost woody debris on the ground beetles abundance. So one potential reason is that there are some, some data gaps in this cost woody debris. So some science does not have this information on which might influence this, its ability to explain variations in trees and abundance. But definitely cost woody debris should be a very important predictors in wildlife species because they just simply offer shelters of, uh, against climate warming. So here we found the cost woody debris is just following canopy nitrogen and uh, above gap, the interaction between gap and temperature. So we tried the interaction between temperature and the cost woody debris, and that effects has a lower prediction accuracy compared to the gap, the interaction between temperature and gap. So that's why we focus on temperature and gap instead. And uh, yes, uh, I also checked the, the, the correlation between gaps and the uh, cost woody debris. There's not a strong correlation between those two. So it's safe to put both of them in the model. Um, if that's also your yeah, wondering.
Great. Um, we have one more right now um, for Roland Kays. Um, first of all, great talk. Um, but the question is, um, how did you get the tree level fruit fecundity to match up with the LIDAR data at NEON sites? I see. Um, Yeah. Okay, so here's the approach we are using. So we basically, so uh, in the background, there's there's a, uh, the, the canopy height models from LIDAR, which is the difference between the canopy surface model minus, uh, 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 I'm sorry, a digital surface model minus a digital elevation model. So the difference gives you the canopy height. And then we are trying to implement a cron delineate, delineation of those uh, tree canopies. And we, we will be able to quantify different polygons so there'll be a uh, treetops and there'll be a crown uh, uh, that, that, is, that, is, uh, that is surrounding these this treetops. So that's how we get the individual tree crowns. We also have the location of the trees where we have the fecundity estimation from the masking inference and forecast model. And then we link those tree fecundity of, uh, estimate with the crowns. So that's why you can see some of the trees has no prediction of fecundity because they are simply small, uh, not big enough to produce any seeds, or there's a mismatch between the crown and uh, maybe there's a coordinate error that uh, caused a mis mismatch between uh, observed uh, fecundity from Mustin model and also the, the tree crowns from AOP LIDAR. So that's the approach we use to match those two, uh, two data sets. And then, um, so yeah, that's how, how yeah, I think that answers the question, the tree level fruits with uh, LIDAR data at neon sites. Um, I could take this moment to ask one because I, I was going to ask about fecundity. Um, do you know why so many species, when they have higher foliar phosphorus, there's a negative trade-off with fecundity? That seems interesting and a bit surprising. What do you think is going on there? <laughs> Yes, that's a, a good question. So I can only speculate on those because I haven't done any like, mechanism uh, modeling on those approach. So uh, this slide summarizes two hypotheses. So if we, so in like in horticultural ap applications, if you apply fertilizer, so it can potentially increase uh, the crop yield in a, in, a, in an agricultural field. So uh, the amount of potassium, especially potassium can increase the crop yield. So however, if you apply too much fertilizer, so the, the, the crop will just grow crazy and uh, there'll be lots of uh, vegetation growth instead of a uh, uh, fecundity, uh, uh, in, instead of a crop yield. So basically there's a trade-off between uh, reproduction and growth. So basically we found, we're, we're, uh, basically we are exploring the, the coefficient of, uh, term, of fecundity versus foliar nitrogen and phosphorus. So it's not like actually not a, uh, that's a causation between those two. So we are not sure why we we'll, we'll just observe a negative relationship between phosphorus and the fecundity. Is is we are not sure if just the increase in phosphorus can reduce fecundity, or uh, it's just uh, if you increase phosphorus can in introduce lots of growth instead of uh, reproduction. So there is the potential trade off between reproduction and, and growth, but we are not sure if those signals are pointing to those direction because that's not causation. It's just a simple coefficients of the response to uh, phosphorus. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. so interesting. Maybe Mastiff needs to do some targeted fertilization experiments or something. Uh, try to. Anyway, yeah, well, thank you for that. I, yeah, thank you very much. Looks like there's one more um, question from Hanshi Chen. Um, could you share your experience on uh, how to set up the hypothesis reasonably and how you chose um, the related variables regarding the biodiversity research? Oh, yeah, that's a, also a good question. So I would suggest to read the literature to find usually which variables are used uh, to model biodiversity change. And, uh, you, know, you know, it's hard to find literature that focuses on food supply because it feels, uh, even though it's a fundamental role of biodiversity, but it's still, uh, there's no information on how much seed the tree produce in a given year. So that's why we are trying to incorporate the food supply information. But there are many variables that are uh, important in regulating biodiversity change, such as the one I mentioned earlier, uh, the canopy height models, uh, the, sorry, the anatory density canopy heights and terrain roughness. And uh, those, uh, and when you are trying to quantify which variables are important for biodiversity change, try to think about the mechanism that controls um, sorry, go, let me go back to the slides. 
so like for the interaction between gaps and the temperature, there are two potential mechanisms. And so like one can, this is from a, a traditional view of a, a microclimatologist. So basically large gaps might amplify the impacts of climate warming. And then another hypothesis will be for traditional ecologists. So they can provide local refugees. So my uh, my recommendation will be just look at the literature that try to provide as many hypotheses as possible. Okay. There's also one question in the chat. I'm not sure is that is that mine chat or? <clears throat> yeah, no. Go. I was going to point that out that someone was asking about sharing software and sharing code. Tom, do you want to? I'm, I'm sure some of the work that's published, maybe it's already publicly available, or what would you say on, would you say to that? Yes, there's a, a GitHub repo that uh, is uh, associated with Grand Middles modeling. It's hosted by the Ecological Forecast Initiative, the so EFI. If you look at that GitHub, you'll be able to find the code. And as for the, so that's for the Android. As for the new trends, um, so Phil, Phil Thompson has built this uh, really amazing efforts to model continental scale uh, uh, prediction of nutrients. Their data is also publicly available. So you can download their equations and then apply that equation to the NEON AOP data and get the nutrients variables. Send me an email if you couldn't find the link. And the graphs, what's the meaning of the graphs? Oh, you, you mean the draw, draw the graphs of the figure? Uh, I think that's also in the EFI. Uh, GitHub repository. Okay, I hope that answers the question. I think so. Well, unless there's any other questions, this seems like a good time to wrap up. Thanks again to our speaker for a fantastic talk. A lot of thought-provoking results shown. We're so excited to see all the uh, exciting things you're doing with Neon Data. And for everyone else, please consider joining us. We've got two upcoming events. We have a, our first data skills webinar. It's going to be September 26th. You can sign up for that on the Science Seminars webpage. And our next seminar, speaking of FE, is going to be on the um, ecological forecasting and the neon forecasting challenge October 10th. So please consider joining for that. Until then, take care. Thanks so much.